Today we come to the last in our three-point series on a very unpleasant subject. For Christians, it is our past as man the sinner. But I remind you once again, unpleasant as is the reflection on our past, it is absolutely essential to our present in Christ. Unless we have the conviction of being man the sinner, we can never come to Jesus who shall save his people from their sins. And as a matter of fact, even after we come to him, we're constantly reminded of the depth of his love and grace as we reflect on the sin from which he has saved us. And through all eternity, as we contemplate perdition for the lost, we will be saying, there but for the grace of God go I. So awful as the subject man the sinner is, it's indispensable to the story of man the saint to which we come next. But before we take up this last in the three-point development of man the sinner, man who hates himself, let me remind you once again the overview of our series. We deal with man, oh man, the three faces of Adam. First of all, man as man, and then what we are now concluding today, man as sinner, man who hates God, man who hates man, and man who hates himself, the consideration for today. And then in our next lecture, we move on to this very happy, salutary theme of man as saint and take up first of all man as regenerated and then man as justified and the faith, the justification, and the sanctification that are a part of it, looking finally at man as glorified when that which is begun in this world is perfected in the world which is to come when man is established as a saint forever in a condition from which he never again shall fall. That's the time when he will be pasa non pecara, and there'll be no pasa pecara there. But let's address ourselves now to the fact that man who hates God and hates man hates even himself. In a certain sense, all men are like Esau, who sell their birthright for a mess of pottage. And the irony is, they not only lose their birthright, they don't even get the mess of pottage. Or if they do, they find it has worms in them, in it, when they come to consume it. Now you would assume that this is square one, where man really can rest. All right. He's a man who hates God. All right. He may even reluctantly admit that he hates his fellow man. But one thing he doesn't hate is himself. He loves himself. That may be what has caused him to hate God and man, but at least he has this grim consolation that he loves himself. He comes to rest on that particular point, somewhat the way George Bernard Shaw at a party when his hostess asked him, are you enjoying yourself? He said, yes, fortunately, that's all I am enjoying. You might think that man, the sinner, even though he doesn't enjoy God and he doesn't enjoy his fellow man, as he may admit in moments of honesty, he will claim that he's enjoying himself, at least. Said about another character in a modern novel, her name was Edith, and she was bordered on the north, south, east, and west by Edith. Though you would suppose, at least, she would be happy with Edith, but alas, even that isn't true. Though it looks as if this gratification, which the sinner fails, at least in himself, has a kind of corroboration in the scripture when it says, for example, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? It sounds a little bit as if at least he has a grip on himself uh, and he does have his own soul in his own possession and that's of such value that he wouldn't give it in exchange for anything at all. And you remember how when Paul is commenting in Ephesians 5 on the union of a man 
and his wife in marriage, that man loves his wife as he loves his own self because they are one in marriage and no man hates his own flesh, Paul argues. He nourishes and cherishes it and so because his wife is one flesh with him and he loves his own flesh, he loves his wife because he loves himself. And so it looks as if there's a kind of support for the proposition that man does at least love himself. He may hate God, he may hate other men, but he does love himself and that includes his wife because she is a part of himself. But what the Bible means by that is something we've alluded to earlier. Not that a man really does love himself, but that he thinks he does and that he promotes what he thinks is for his own interest and everything he does is motivated by self-concern. I mean, that's an ineradicable part of human nature and that, I think, is what the Bible is taking cognizance of. As a matter of fact, it is a noticeable thing and it's emphasized very strongly in Puritan evangelism. I suppose there's been no epoch in the history of evangelism where as much as stress has been placed on appeal to self-interest evangelistically as was done by the Puritans in their preaching in their day. But the Bible has that same emphasis. It asks the person, what will he give in exchange for his soul? What does it profit a man? If he gain the whole world and lose his own soul. You see, the Bible is reasoning with man the sinner. He's obviously interested in himself. He seems at least to love himself. And so the Bible is saying, if you love yourself, how can you part with eternal life? If you really are interested in your own well-being, how can you secure eternal damnation? The Bible talks plain cold turkey on that point, assuming man has at least an interest in himself if you do have an interest in yourself, then surely you'll come to me, says Christ. Surely you won't turn your back on me when I'm in your best interest and so on. In other words, the Bible appeals to uh, self-love. There's no uh, embarrassment there in a sort of capitalistic, if I may put it that way, note in the Bible. It takes people's treasures seriously. It assumes that they take their treasures seriously and it reasons with them on the basis of uh, their treasures that they value and suggest to them that if they really are interested in their own well-being, Christianity should interest them because it is truly and solely and exclusively for their self-interest. Take, for example, our Lord's teaching on the Sabbath. He labors the point that the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath has very strict requirements and does require man to curtail certain activities and to confine himself to certain endeavors. And it, it's, a, it's a law. It's a commandment. But Christ points out that that law, that commandment, that restriction is made for man. It's for his good. He wasn't made for it. It was made for him. And if it's observed, as Christ commands it, man will find it's to his benefit to have done so. Now the Bible appeals constantly as a friend of man and pitches its gospel, if you may put it that way, to a person who really has self-interest. It's not ashamed to do that. It assumes it. It isn't acting as if there's something sordid about it. It treats it as a natural concern and appeals to persons. If they really are interested in themselves, they will be interested in the gospel. Now, the Bible, while it appeals to self-concern and self-love and a legitimate desire for self-preservation and so on, it calls away from selfish love. I repeat, the Bible appeals to self-love. And any sinner who says, this much I know I love myself, that if you really love yourself, here is something you will truly love. And therefore, appealing to self-love, it invites to the gospel. At the same time, it warns against 
selfish love. Now, what is the difference between self-love and selfish love? Well, you see, self-love is a legitimate concern for oneself. That's a, a duty, as we'll see in a moment. And there's nothing evil or wrong about it because God is the maker of the self and the obligation to nurture it and so on is a divine mandate. So self-love or self-interest or self-concern, which is native to man, is something which is as proper as breathing. And uh, a motive, which though abused by man, is nevertheless intrinsically instinctive and legitimate. Now what is selfish love? Well, selfish love, you see, is an illegitimate concern for myself. I don't think it has ever been more sharply distinguished from self-love than Bishop Butler in his Rolls Chapel lectures in the 18th century. One of our finest modern ethicists, the Bishop of Bristol, pointed out that the difference between a good an instinctive and natural self-love and an evil, unethical, sinful, selfish love is that the latter is a other disregarding love. Self-love is a proper concern for oneself. Selfish love is an improper concern for oneself to the detriment of other selves. If I love myself in such a way that I hate your well-being or oppose your prosperity because it may impinge on mine, then that kind of love is despicable and not admirable. As I say, following Bishop Butler on that point, the difference between a legitimate self-love to which the Bible unashamedly appears, appeals, and a despicable, selfish love is that the latter is other disregarding. It is not merely a concern for me, but it's an unconcern for you that makes that kind of concern for me a bad thing, whereas a mere concern for me, which was not a disregard for you, but a concern for you as well would be a proper and a legitimate motivation. This is the reason our Lord says, unless you lose your life for my sake, you'll not find it. But if you do lose your life for my sake, you will gain it. You see what he means by that is, if you lose, give up, abandon, selfish love, you'll really find true love. And if you hang on to selfish love, you'll lose yourself. If you lose that kind of love, you'll gain real love. But if you insist on hanging on to that, you'll lose even what you're hanging on to. To him that hath, it shall be given. To him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. You sell your soul for a mess of pottage, and you don't even get the pottage, is what our Lord is actually saying there. That's the reason the heaviest accent in our Lord's moral teaching, according to Henry Joel Cadbury's book, Jesus, What Manner of Man, the heaviest accent in Christ's ethical teaching is the negative, deny thyself. Most of you people are too young to remember a song that used to circulate that was supposed to be a sermon, incidentally. That's the reason one time when I was in a restaurant and somebody else put a mercilessly, mercilessly put a quarter in the slot and I didn't have a slot calling for silence. I had to listen to this song, but I was quite interested in it because it purported to be a sermon. And the theme of it was uh, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative. I was quite intrigued on the text which they get for that and so on. I won't pursue that any further, but I'll assure you one thing, it never came from the teaching of Jesus. He never eliminated the negative. According to Henry Joel Cadbury, he emphasized the negative. He had more to say about denying of yourself 
than he did about anything positive. Now you see what he is doing when he makes that as an absolute prime initial condition of entering in his kingdom is he is recognizing that man, the sinner, has a selfish preoccupation with himself. And that has to go. The language is strong as if the person hearing it knows full well this is like stripping the flesh from your back. Christ says you must pull yourselves up by the roots. As I say, her name was Edith. She's bordered on the north, south, east, and west by Edith. Her name is John. He bordered on the north, south, east, and west by John. And as a prime prerequisite to entering this kingdom, the person who's bordered on the north, south, east, and west by himself has to pull himself up by the roots. It's not a matter of denying this or denying that. A matter of denying yourself. That's the problem. Not what you do, but you who do it. You do it because not that you have a proper self-love, but because you have an improper selfish love. What the Bible is really saying about man the sinner who hates even himself is that this kind of selfishness which characterizes all the fallen sons of Adam prior to their regeneration, and it has a long hangover even after that, is this, that selfishness equals self-hate. That if you are selfish, you not only do not love yourself, you positively hate yourself. If you have an other disregarding love, you not only hate your neighbor whom you disregard, but you hate yourself who disregard your neighbor. A selfish love is a self-destructing love. And consequently, if you love yourself that way, face up to it. You hate yourself. We talk about people who are psychologically sick, and we call them masochists who get their kicks out of tormenting themselves. But what you don't find in abnormal psychology is the fact that all the children of Adam are masochists. And they're not suffering from psychological aberration, but from moral aberration. And that that person, for example, who's a sadist, we define a sadist as a person who gets his kicked out of tormenting other persons, is himself a masochist. That is, a sadist is a masochist, a person who hates other persons, who torments other persons, who seems to get his kick out of making other people unhappy, is torturing himself is heaping up wrath against the day of wrath. That's the way the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans 2, 4, and 5. God forbears against these enemies of His, who, as we noticed in an earlier lecture, hate Him. God forbears to pour out all His wrath upon them. Why? So that His forbearance would lead them to repentance. Now, what do they do with His forbearance? which is designed to give them an opportunity to turn away from their selfish love, to pull themselves up by their roots and to take up their crosses and follow Jesus. What do they do? Not that. They exploit the opportunity which divine forbearance provides to heap up more wrath against the day of wrath, to continue their selfish love, which is nothing less than their own hatred, masochistically, to torment themselves by hating God, hating their neighbors. They hate even themselves. One of the grim figures of American criminology is this Ma Barker. Some of you may have read about. Boy, she was tough. And she bred, you remember, a group of young criminals who were tough too. He made them go to Sunday school. 
wouldn't let them miss a session, lived in mortal fear they might possibly believe anything, but she wanted to keep up the appearances of being a good family because she was going to be a good criminal family and she didn't want anybody to know it. She had a husband with a conscience, not much courage, but some conscience, and he was very unhappy, though not very bold in resisting the resolute wickedness of his wife and their sons. A time came when Ma Barker had enough of Pa Barker, and unbeknownst to him, the family went out to the country, and under Ma Barker's direction, they got shovels out from the trunk, and they started to dig, all of them, the boys and Pa Barker as well, a big trench. Pa Barker didn't know it at the time, but he was helping to build, dig his own grave, in which he was shortly after having been murdered by his sons and his ruthless wife, buried. That's what the sinner is always doing. He's digging his own grave, or he's gathering sticks for his own fire. The sadist is a masochist. The selfish person is a self-hater. Man so far from having this one object, which he can surely love, has the one object which he surely hates. His animosity of God only promotes the blessedness of God, and his hatred of the children of God only aids and abets their growth in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. But his hatred of himself really comes to rest as he truly self-destructs. Now let me close this somber theme A man the sinner as man who hates not only God and his fellow man, but ultimately and most of all himself let me close with this reminder that self-love is a duty and that the selfish love of the sinner should not blind us to the fact that there is a good form of self-love which as much is as much of a duty as selfish love is a vice to be shunned. We are commanded not only not to hate ourselves, as sinners do hate themselves, but to love ourselves. I know there are some Christian people who are uncomfortable with that admonition, but I don't see any way of construing our Lord's words as anything less than a divine mandate to love ourselves. When he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself, he indicates the fact that love for God and neighbor and self is the sum total of the moral law. I must love myself. You have a duty to love yourself. Only as the Bishop of Cambridge put it more than a century ago, in the schools we learn, first person, I. Second person, you. Third person, he. But in the school of Christ, we are taught first person, he. Second person, you. Third person, I. I know there are great ethicists, such as Thomas Aquinas, for example, who have wondered whether one can begin his love with any other person than the first person, I. There's a certain truth in that. Of course, love, my love, has to begin with me and from me. But when the Bishop of Cambridge said, in the school of Christ, first person is he, and second person is you, and third person is I, I think what he means is that though I must initiate my own love, the hierarchy of values doesn't begin with me. It ends with me. It begins with him and moves to you, terminates on me. 
Only I have to remind you that though you have to avoid on the one hand the selfish love of the sinner, which is really self-hate, and you must actually cultivate self-love, and every true love you have for your God and your neighbor is going to promote your own well-being, the principle which Christ introduces at this point is you mustn't let your left hand know what your right hand does. Which being interpreted means, I think, this. I've let you in on a secret. You're in on the know now that every time you love me, it's going to help you. And the more you love God, the more it's going to benefit yourself. Now you know that. The Bible teaches it. You're not supposed to be ignorant about things like this. But what you're warned at this point is, since you're in on the secret, since you know very well that every time your heart goes out toward God or toward your neighbor, it's going to advance your own interest. But Christ says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't love God and don't love your neighbor because of the fact that in so doing, you will be loving yourself. See to it that when you love God, you love God because you love God. And when you love your neighbor, it's because you have a genuine love for your neighbor. Though you do know, though that isn't the motivation for doing it, that you're loving yourself at the same time. So I say to you, man the sinner, why do you hate yourself? Why do you destroy yourself? If you really have an interest in yourself, why don't you come to him who says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me? That's in the best interest of you, the sinner. Won't you stop destroying yourself? Won't you show a real interest in the one person you profess to love but actually hate and come to him who would be, if you will accept him, the savior of your soul forevermore? Shall we pray? O oh God, our Father, we thank Thee that though we have been sinners, Thou hast convicted us of our sin and convicted us of Christ's love for us. And we have, by divine grace, found that where sin abounded, grace did yet more abound. May many other, the fallen sons and daughters of Adam, Man the sinner who hates God and hates his neighbor and hates himself, see the folly of his way and the glory of the way of the God-man, Jesus Christ, and come to him now, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. In his name, amen.